Good morning and welcome to the True Disciples broadcast. My name is Dr. Kevin Baird and I am the lead pastor of Legacy Church here in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm the executive director as well of the South Carolina Pastors Alliance and I'm so glad that you made your way to this radio station and that you're listening to this broadcast today. This broadcast is actually the second part of a message that we began last week in a series that I entitled The Responsibility of Christian Liberty. And uh, a lot of the precepts and the teaching that I'll be talking about today certainly has application with regards to our nation. Uh, In fact, it has application with regards to our households. But what I've been trying to share these uh, last minutes and in this message has uh, to do with Uh, our place of freedom as a Christian. What are we free to do? What are we free from? Uh, Whom are we free to serve? What exactly is the responsibility of freedom? Because freedom isn't always getting to do everything that just crosses your mind. And so we've been teaching on this subject. It's an important subject in the era that we're living in, and today is part two of that message. At the conclusion of the message, we're going to give you some ways to contact us, let you know a little bit more about us. Uh, We would love to hear from you, let you know our website and how uh, you can communicate with us. But we want to, just as quickly as possible, make our way into the message this morning, the second half of what I entitled, You Can't Make Me. Be blessed as you listen this morning. Most of you know I'm grieved by the inability of the 21st century church to arise to its calling of holiness and integrity. We all know self-identified Christians who are without character and simple morality in their walk with the Lord. We're living in a lawless, standardless, unteachable, antinomian era that has produced a deception that is across our nation. Jesus said that would be the atmosphere of the end times. We divorce at will. We abort our, our... children without thought of what it will happen. We fornicate like barnyard animals. We live together unmarried with impunity. We get drunk, blasted, buzzed, jazzed consistently. We carouse, we're addicted to pornography, we are in debt, we gossip, we hate, we backbite. I could give you the list at the same rate as those who are in the world. And all the while, we tout our freedom. I mean, if I were the world, I would ask, what exactly are you free from? You're free from what? Now, I said clearly last Sunday that the law cannot redeem you. It can't redeem you. That's what Paul said in Galatians. He said, if the law could redeem you, there'd be no necessary. It wouldn't be necessary to send the seed as the promise to redeem you. So the law can't redeem you but we've not understood the place it has. You see, Jesus was not a lawbreaker. The Bible says that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And because of that misunderstanding, it has caused the church to be impotent and seen as irrelevant as we are as dysfunctional as the world. Our bondages and our hypocrisies are seen in the pulpit to the pew. So, in response to that, what I've tried to do through the years is that is that I've wanted to raise a church that tried its best. Now hear me, I understand ain't none of us perfect. If you think you're perfect, just thinking it made you imperfect. But we've tried our best to be a standard bearer to a culture in order to tell them that this is the possibility, life as a possibility in Jesus Christ. I'm not here to reflect the culture. My God, it's falling apart. And to whatever extent we've been successful in that it's not happened believe me without the misunderstanding of many and the exhaustion of this pastor to be perfectly blunt it's difficult to make people do anything you can't make people be obedient you can't make people accept the conviction you can't make people live according to a standard You can't make anybody really in America do much of anything. In fact, the only way you'll ever see those things happen isn't by making people do it. It's when their heart gets in it. It's hard to motivate a generation. 
to maintain some semblance of Christian standard, even to be a minimum disciple in an era that sees simple obedience as legalism. Isn't that interesting? You just, you put, some of you are on Facebook. Go ahead and put, just put a statement from the scripture out there by way of one of God's commands and just wait for the, you're judging me and I, you're a legalist. Just wait. You can't call a generation to obedience to the word without being called a legalist. remember we were having a conversation recently and I, I started thinking, you know, we, we've done and, and, and we're going to be doing some more in, in the near future uh, encounter weekends. It used to amaze me how people after they had received Jesus Christ would be so stubborn about getting free. You know, it was amazing in encounter weekend how you would literally have to go home with them practically the last week before encounter to make sure they would get to the encounter weekend. It always amazed me how you had to make sure their alarm was set so they'd wake up in time. It always amazed me. It just, it amazed me. In fact, what began to dawn on me was I wanted you to be free more than you wanted to be free. In fact, for some people, you're counting on me to keep you saved. I mean, everybody, don't they? Everybody wants their fire insurance policy. Everyone wants to make sure that when they die, they get to go to heaven. But nobody really wants true freedom. Because what we say is the minute you're, it's preached or it's taught or it's shared or however it comes to you, our motto is, well, who died and made you God? You're not my boss. You can't make me. And indeed, that is true. No man can make you do anything. I can't make you do something. A life group leader can't make you do something. Your best friend can't make you do something. Your spouse can't make you do something. Your good friend can't make you do something. Nobody can make you do anything. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm free from all men. No man can make you do whatever you don't want to do. In fact, I'll just share something with you. I believe this to be true. God can't make you do everything. That's why we quench. The scripture says you can quench the Holy Spirit. You can resist the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's amazing to me. He doesn't make people get saved, does he? He doesn't make you get filled with the Spirit, does he? I mean, if he could make people do that, I figured he'd have the world by now. He can't make you pray. Don't you think if he could make people pray, he'd just make them pray? But he doesn't make you do that, does he? He calls us to it. He woos us to it. He wants us to be drawn to it. So it should come as no surprise that if even God isn't going to make anything happen, then it shouldn't surprise us when other people can't make it happen. I'll just give you an illustration. I, I started to get this epiphany at the first time. You know, when we first came over here and made our transitions, you know, it used to be when we'd have early morning prayer time and, and you know, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And so I just kind of, you know, you know, me just pastor, he just lives in la la land. You know, I just kind of assumed since Jesus said his house would be a house of prayer, that maybe the church would pray. Isn't that a crazy thought? I just read it in the Bible and I just assumed he meant it. It's crazy. I know. Just, just bear with me. I, I'm just a nut. <laughs> And, and so what we did for years, and you know this is what we do, we'd call people in, we'd drive them in, we'd, you know, especially we'd ask even leaders, you know, could you be here on time? And we'd ask them to be here on time. And it's just amazing how we can be on time for anything and everything, but sometimes going to prayer just isn't on our list. I always wondered, I, I've wondered with our kids and I've wondered in our own life, how in the world do your children, for an example, get to school on time when all I've seen maybe is 30 minutes late? They've got to be in trouble a lot. How does your boss handle that? And yet, with the God of the universe, we have trouble. So here's what I, I decided. I just decided this. Hey, I can't make anybody do anything. I can't make them. I can't do anything. This is, I'm heading on. And if you want to come, come join me. If you don't, I love you. God love you. But I'm going on with God. Because you can't make people do what they don't want to do. You see, we got to understand, after a while, what happens is we reveal the heart. See, if I could get saved for you, I'd do it. i tried that. If I could get free for you, I would do it. But I can't. 
I can't, I can't make you do anything. No one can make you do anything you don't want to do. So the question arises, and it, I put it on the screen, what keeps people from being unrestrained if you can't make them do anything? Now, this was always my greatest concern. And it's, it's the same concern parents have for their children because <clears throat> here's, here was our greatest fear. It was my greatest fear, and if, it may not have come to you yet, but it's going to be one of your greatest concerns, is that as your kids get older, and especially when they get in those upper teens and they're about ready to leave the house, and you're beginning to understand that there's going to be a day that they're not going to be under your roof, your greatest concern is the minute they get out from underneath this roof, what are they going to do? I mean, that concerns, I mean, it concerned me. Because you, you know kids leave the parents' house and they go to school and, and they get this giant brain cramp. They go to college and all of a sudden everything you taught them under that roof goes right out the window when they go to college. Once the boundaries are removed, all of a sudden they experience what they think is freedom and they just go crazy. You know, the same is for a Christian. When you force people... When you force people to function under legalism, you may get the right response for a little while, but it's not in their heart. The minute the rule is gone, they go nuts. The children of Israel is a great example. You know, when Moses, Moses was able to solicit their deliverance from Egypt, and he begins, and this is really interesting because he, he brings some order to this five million person chaos that he's moving across the desert. He gets to Sinai. He leaves them for just a few moments up in Mount Sinai, and the first thing they do is they melt all the gold down and they build a golden calf. And they go crazy. <laughs> kind of makes me wonder what happens during pastor's sabbatical. I mean, it just... <laughs> I, I, sorry, I couldn't resist. So the question is, how do you restrain people? How's, how's restraint come? Well, I'll say it again. The only thing that can restrain people and ever has restrained people is their heart. What's in the heart? Give a person their freedom and watch what they do. I will tell you it will unveil the heart. So the question is that if the heart is the only thing that can bring a sense of circumscription to our lives, if the heart is the only thing that can bring a sense of order to our life, then the question is, if we're born with this sinful heart bent toward evil, which I told you was one of the primary doctrines of Christianity, that we've all been born into sin or evil, then what do you do with a heart that's naturally hardwired to say, you can't make me? What do you do with that, pastor? I tell you what happens. It's what God told Ezekiel when he said, I will take out of you that heart of stone. And I will put inside of you a heart of flesh. What he was saying there in this wonderful imagery was, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to take that old thing out and I'm going to put this new thing in. And that is what we call conversion. Conversion. We're living in an era of decisions, but not conversions. People make decisions without having conversion. I read to you last week that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then he goes on to say, and we all with unveiled face are beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed by it, he says, from glory to glory. So this transformation or this conversion is a perpetual thing in the heart of a believer. You have to have a heart transplant for that to happen. All of us, me too. All of us are born with this heart that's screaming. You can't make me. Your children are born with that same heart. You can't make me. Me do what me want to do. You're not my boss. We're all born with that heart. How do you get rid of that heart? Well, you can direct it for a short while by implementing uh, the boundaries, but ultimately there has to come conversion. That's why I'm looking at some of you and I'm just kind of bouncing back and forth. I really had not intended on doing this, but that's why we've got to pray that a generation that has grown up in church gets converted. Amen. Because just because your kid goes to church doesn't make them a Christian. You've heard me say this any more than if you let them sleep in the garage, you'll make them a car. 
And so we got to cry out for a generation, starting with our own, that says, God, convert their heart. Transform their heart. I can guide them and train them and direct them for a season, but there's going to come a day that I'm going to have to let them go and trust you. And at that moment, if their heart is not converted, they're in trouble. And that's kind of where, you know, for me, sort of as a pastor, I've come to as well. I understand that, that as much, I understand I'm the shepherd and I can, I can bring order and direction and guidance and maybe people even grant me a little bit more influence. But, but I, I get it that you can't make someone do what they really don't want to do. And so all you can do is train them up in the way they should go. And then cry out to God that their hearts would be converted. See, that's where America is. See, you can look at it statistically, and we're growing churches bigger than we've ever grown them. I mean, I was looking at the statistical numbers the other day about how large churches are getting and about how big things are getting and about how much is this and that and the other. And I'm telling you, I'm watching all of this as our, as our culture continues to spiral. Why is that? It's because we're parked in a garage, but we ain't a car. And we're parked in churches, but we're not converted. And there comes a moment that you're going to sense, I believe, out of your heart. And it's, and, it's, and it's not we're questioning anyone's salvation. In fact, how could I question it if it's the real thing? But the point I'm trying to make is this, that it's easier to walk the walk when you've got a new heart. It's easier to be obedient when you've got a new heart. I've often said this, man cannot put a yoke on you. You can say Amen. No man can put a yoke on you, but Jesus will. The difference between man's yoke, which is hard, and Jesus' yoke is this. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what he meant by that is this, that when he apprehends you and when he corrals you and when he yokes you for his purposes, he's going to ask things of you. And the reason it's easy and light is because you don't have the same heart you had before. You got a new heart that says, yes, Lord, whatever you want, I am yours. I'm yours. If anyone ever looks at you and says, that's just too hard, just smile at them. Listen, I, you know, not everyone lives like I live, and you don't have to live like I live, but my life's not hard. And the reason my life isn't that hard is because of a heart. I do what I do because in the heart, I desire to do it. So we've got to begin to pray that, that the body of Christ, so to speak, has a heart transplant. The heart that was bent on its own way has to be replaced by a heart that wants God's way. So the question becomes, what must happen to the church to break out of this lawless, antinomian, you can't make me age, what's got to happen? Well, God sends revival and he begins to convert the hearts again. You ever notice how revival always starts in the church? Isn't that an odd place for it to start? I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. I think that's probably exactly where it needs to start. That our hearts are converted. And when they're converted, things start to happen. Jesus told us, Jesus told us that, there, that in the last days, that the church would be full of tares as well as wheat. Things that would look like it might be actually right, but internally it's not right. And that's why... That's why I'm just sharing this with you is because right now, all of us in this room, and I want to believe and I will believe that 99.9% .9 of everybody in this room, you would say, yep, I'm converted. I know I'm converted and that's great. And we'll all sing hallelujah. And I have no way of verifying that or not. All I will say is this, that if there's not a heart that desires everything that God has, and I'm, I'm not talking just the promises, I'm talking even the boundaries that will get you there. See, I've come to understand that God asks me things, and, and, and he isn't asking it just so he can beat the fire out of me. He's doing things in order to get me to a promise. And I trust him in that regard. Do you trust him in that regard? The only, interesting, the only difference between the 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 newborn believer and the one that's walked for maybe decades. Well, there may be numbers of differences, but let me, let me tell you, I go back, let me, let me take two steps back. The similarity between somebody that's 30, 40 years old in the Lord and maybe somebody who's just a few weeks old in the Lord, there's one commonality. 
Their lives won't look exactly the same. The circumspection that has come to their life won't be exactly the same. The new person who's just recently come to know the Lord, the Lord's going to be working on them. Things will be falling off. There's grace to walk that out. And so they're not going to have all the understanding or teaching or discipline or instruction or experience. And so there's grace. Believe me, there is grace. Nobody's expecting somebody one week old in the Lord to look like somebody who's 30 years old in the Lord. But this is the same. The same thing exists between both. And it's this. There is a passion. There is a passion. There is a fervency to want all that God has. My life may look different than your life. Your life may look different than my life. Maybe you got a better handle on some areas than I do. Maybe I got a better handle than you do. I don't know. We can't measure each other up by each other. Then you will get into legalism. But what we can measure is this. Are you passionate for everything that God has? That's that's the thing uh, that's the same in all of us. You know, Trace isn't here this morning. She's uh, over in kids' church. But she's told the story before how uh, she grew up uh, really in the church that we both were a part of in legalism and strict, strict boundaries. I told you last week, anybody that comes up to me and hollers legalism, I, I, I come with me, I'll show you legalism. My wife tells the story of how she grew up in a home, and it's no fault of her folks that that was the church they were in, and it was the church we all grew up in, and we just sort of assimilated certain things into our system, and, and she will tell the story how she grew up in a home that had very, very strict boundaries, a very rigid rule system, and in the church we grew up in, it included everything from the clothes that you were allowed to wear, there were clothes rules, there were attendance rules. Uh, at certain venues around town, um, she was expected growing up to adhere to the convictions of the household, and, and a lot of them were just probably a lot stronger, certainly, than we have used in our house uh, because, truthfully, uh, uh, they were just, some of them were crazy. And she explains, though, that as she grew up in this household, it was at some level easy because she could always say, in fact, a lot of times, Growing up in high school, her friends would ask her to places or do certain things, and her response would be, well, I can't do that because my dad won't let me. My dad won't let me. And so she could kind of skirt it off and, and make sure uh, that he took the hit. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't really me. Dad won't make me. You know, dad, dad, dad isn't going to let me. And, uh, and so it kept her, by her own admission, from developing... Uh, her own convictions and her own standards. There was a day that she will tell you about that she arrived that she was asking her dad about somewhere I think she was going or something like that, and her dad looked at her, and actually it was a, it was a very smart and savvy thing for him to do. He told her that from this point forward, she was no longer under the expectation to adhere to his standard, to the house's standard, or to any other standard, she could no longer say that her dad was making her do this. She was on her own. And she said at that moment, she said it almost scared her. Because suddenly she couldn't just opt out by saying, well, you know, dad won't let me or mom won't let me. But all of a sudden, she had to decide what was in her heart. She had to suddenly get mature and develop her own walk with God and develop her own convictions. In other words, she had to find her own spirituality. She had to find her own maturity. And in some ways, and she will tell you that it became harder because it's easy to be able to say, yeah, yeah, I, I can't do that because, you know, I, you know, I go to that church or, you know, I hang out with that pastor or I just, you know, I, and you're skirting it off. And that's why I said maturity is hard because there comes a day that you have to grow up and out of your heart, you have to make the decision, what is it that God has asked me to do? And will I live by that? Because that's where this transformation begins to take place. Are, are you following me? And we're living in an era where the heart and hearts have not been changed. They've not been changed. And, and again, I, I realize someone could watch this on YouTube and, you know, they can hear what I might have to say, and, and they'll think I'm judging in this matter. When I tell you that 
that sometimes you, when you look at folk and you scratch your head and you say, I don't get, I don't get how they can do this. Listen, I understand there's liberties, and we're going to talk about the place of liberty uh, next time when we're together in the place of meat eating. Most people do not understand the meat eating passages that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians. We'll get to that. And uh, we're going to tell a lot more stories with that as well. But for most people, you have to understand that when you're seeing their life, you're seeing their heart. When you see their life, you see their priorities. That's not judging you. That's just making observation. Nobody's ju judging means when we drop the gavel and we say this is the outcome. Nobody's dropping the gavel. I'm just simply saying that, that your life betrays your heart. And, and the honest part is this, that you be able to look at your life and to be able to say, this, this is how my life looks, and somehow or another, if my life is looking a certain way, then maybe my heart isn't really where I thought it was. Because here's the day we're getting into. God, God is saying, and I believe he's giving us over. I believe he's giving this nation over. And the moment the moment he gives this nation over will be the moment we will see. And we're seeing it right now. We're seeing what's in people's hearts. And that, that freedom, when it comes, it will betray the heart. And so as we get down to the end of this word, the, the question is simply this. What's in your heart? I don't know what's in your heart. Your neighbor doesn't know what's in your heart. Truthfully, your spouse doesn't know what's in your heart. It's only you and God that really knows what's in your heart. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a simple heart check. Is that okay in the house of God to take a heart check? I would think it'd be a good thing to measure it, to be honest. To say, Lord, is, 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 is there a heart in here that needs converted? Maybe there's aspects. I, I think aspects of it may yet be converted. Maybe some of it is dead and it can be brought alive again. But we need, this is the era that we need our hearts alive and fervent and passionate towards God again. Well, I hope that message was indeed helpful to you, uh, a challenge to you, and uh, would really touch your heart. Because ultimately, as I mentioned, that's where God works. He's the only one that can reach inside of you and touch your heart and uh, literally transform it. And so that's what we are praying and that's what we're believing today that he will touch you in a profound and meaningful way. I hope you'll keep listening to us on this radio station at this exact time. We'll be coming next week and starting a, a brand new message, so it'll be a good time to invite a friend and ask them to listen along as well. Hey, if you'd like to contact us, I want to encourage you to go to our website, Legacy Church SC, like South Carolina, LegacyChurchSC.org, and you can go to that website and you can find just about anything you might need to know. You can get uh, in touch with us. You can send us an email. Uh, you can go to any of our media links at iTunes or at YouTube. And uh, you can begin to uh, find out a little bit more about us, as well as our location here in the Charleston, South Carolina area. Well, I have to leave today. And uh, again, I want to say thank you for listening. We hope that you'll keep making this a part of your Sunday morning. And until next time, as always, I leave you exhorting you to keep faithful, keep consistent in that walk. People are watching you. They want to know whether or not you're the real deal. And as you're walking it out, just remember, Jesus called us to be a true disciple. Thank you again. My name is Dr. Kevin Baird, and we appreciate you listening. And until next time, we say God bless you.